So people are filtering in from around the world. Welcome to those of you who have just joined. And I think we'll get going now. So once again, good morning, good evening to all of you for to the second live session of Deep Week 2021. The deep ocean is a critical, a critical space for our planet. It provides critically important life support services. It keeps our planet in balance. It provides mitigation functions against climate change and sequesters carbon, but it's facing an increasing and growing number of threats from unsustainable fishing, from plastics and other types of pollution and from the impacts of climate change. Fortunately, there is action being taken all around the world to save the deep ocean. And that's what we're focusing on this in this session today is action for the deep ocean health. So we have for you a fantastic panel who's dialed in from around the world. And first, however, we're gonna share with you a series of short films, which we've received from the deep sea conservation member organizations around the world and partners. And we're gonna take you for about 20 minutes first into the deep ocean. And then we'll come back out and hear from our panelists and open the conversation to all of you as to what action is being taken and what more needs to be done. So without further ado, let's share our screen and open up into the deep. The dark abyss was the womb of life. From here, life emerged. We still bear in our bodies, in our blood, in the salty bitterness of our tears, the marks of this remote past. Retracing this past, humans, the present dominator of the emerged earth, are now returning to the depths. This is water we are talking about. It's not brick wall. It doesn't stay in one place. This is water. So if you dig up the bottom, obviously you're going to create dust. And that dust is going to be spread over by the current. And it's going to go over. And, and we don't want to be a testing ground. We don't want our environment damaged. And we will provide alternatives for our people. Why are we trying to mine everything out in one go? What will happen to the next generation? What happened to our grandchildren? Where are they going to get things? Scientists have warned us that um, the impacts of seabed mining will be irreversible. Um, and so with information like that, we really have to ask ourselves the question, are we going to be okay with not being able to undo these impacts? Are we really okay with that? But the problem is you make a mistake and you've lost it all. Yeah. You know, you're not going to get those minerals replaced. Once it's gone, it's gone. So we, you have one go at this, you've got to get it right at the beginning. We need to prepare our people how to manage, uh, you know, how to manage this benefit. Yeah, we know our weakness, we're terrible with money. So let's change that around. Let's have our people be good with money. Train them all so that when we get this benefit, we know how to handle it. I think all we're going to get is money that melts. Money doesn't last. If we are going to do it, and that's a big like, if we are, we should take as much care and do as much research as possible. Find out, you know, do the research first and then find out that everything's great rather than just jumping into it and then finding out that everything's so wrong. Let's wait another 20 years. Let's do this right. Let's do this right. I can't see us getting the best out of this sector if we, as we the Quilans people, are not as involved in it as we can be and we're not getting the best out of it.
No one knows that much information about seabed mining in general and what that looks like for the Cook Islands. You have to actually get people to explain it to you, you have to go to things and ask questions. And for an average Cook Islander who's busy or maybe doesn't actually have that much interest and is doing other things, they're not going to have the time to go and find this out. And they should, it should be kind of like, it should be like politics, it should be like daily news. If this is a sector that we are going to consider going into, or we are considering going into and we're trying to move ahead with, every member of the Islands community needs to be aware of it. I know a little of the seabed money, but I understand from my Bible point of view, I should not be disturbing the ocean floor. Some of our people to a degree are informed, but when we come down to the community level, there's not really uh, understanding, I'd say. Uh, people know what seabed mining is, but they don't understand how it works and uh, what the uh, problems of it are. The people want to know more. They don't just want it to happen, they want more information before anything is actually happening. These resources don't belong to one person, they belong to all of us, and we should all have a say, an opinion, and just, we should all be informed and aware and be made aware of what this process actually means for us. The picture the government paints is this huge income that will come and that it will help everybody. That's the, the, the draw or the lure of, of deep sea mining for our Pacific Islands, I think for Tonga, for Tongans. Uh, is this perception that uh, money will come in and it offset our poverty. Will it offset poverty or will it trigger other things that will cause even greater poverty? I, I think it's, it's, it's the promise of money uh, that, that, that is why I think our governments are, um, are rushing into it. We should just say no. It will damage not only the, the fish but other uh, living organisms. We will have to get together somehow and call on later to stop this madness. Protecting our fishing grounds is a key to our survival. But if we are not protected with reference to this particular interest, I'm sorry to say our people have been duped. Whether it's government or is it private individuals, I think they should have some concern for the preservation of our cultural values and the sea or the moana so-called is part of us. Land and sea for us is our identity and once you destroy these things and not protecting the owners of it, you are totally out of caring for and being leaders of people. The information is still coming in. In fact, there's a lot of papers that have just been published this year um, explaining that deep sea mining might have an effect on locations and islands far away from where minerals are being mined. Within the Seychelles context, again, that's hard to understand. But what we do know is that there's still a lot to discover below uh, 200 meters. We still know that there, there might be um, a coral with some special enzyme that might hold the secrets of the cure for cancer. There might be species that are important for regulation of temperature or, you know, absorption of carbon. We just don't know. And generally, the best thing to do is to do more research and to take the precautionary approach um, as opposed to diving into an industry where we might have extremely long-term effects and we, yeah, we just give in.
so we don't know much. We don't know much. Again, as um, as I've said, we know much more about the petroleum, um, the, the 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 oil and gas deposits here. Okay, there's been a lot of work done. So there's quite a lot of knowledge of the geology and so forth. We don't know much about what nodules or polymetallic um, deposits are around here. We don't even know where these hydrothermal vents are, whether they're extinct or whether they are, they are, they are still active. So that's the first step, is that knowledge. We don't have knowledge of it. So where are these things? So we must be able to gain much more information and much more knowledge of where these deposits are. Secondly, we know that India and China are actively looking since 2018 for these deposits. So they're already in the Indian Ocean. They haven't expressed any interest in coming to the Seychelles EZ. So perhaps we don't have these nodules even here. We don't know. I think the first step for anybody is for the government of Seychelles to link up with some foreign organization or some international organization to try and see if we do have these deposits. So I think when we talk about the blue economy, it cannot be new wine in an old bottle. It can't be just slapping a label on something that's business as usual. So we must look really for out of the box solutions for something very different from where we are today. Seychelles' blue economy depends on a natural environment that is pristine and healthy. The two economic pillars of this country are tourism and fisheries. For them to stay in a state that keeps on giving, they need to be able to provide for not only a local population, but also international visitors. Deep sea bed mining presents an attractive option for government that wants to continue to grow. But like fossil fuel extraction, presents severe threats to our national economy and way of life as well as natural environment. Thus, they cannot be considered sustainable or even equitable. Something like deep sea bed mining, when we know nothing about the deep sea, is tragic as it is stupid. As a country, we must speak about what happens inside our ocean territory as well as outside of our ocean territory. At the International Seabed Authority's meeting, we must tell the world that Seychelles does not know enough and the rest of the world does not know enough to make this decision. Our call is to wait and it's to research and learn more. We want to support a moratorium that takes 10 years of time to understand our ocean and then make informed decision about what is possible for our countries as well as others. If we rush into something like this, the consequences may be too much for our culture, for our lifestyle, for our natural environment and we'll pay a price we cannot afford. As the deep sea mining industry is gaining traction, uh, so too is the opposition. We're seeing environmental organizations speak out against deep sea mining. We're seeing political bodies such as the European Parliament and other countries come out against deep sea mining. Uh, we're seeing scientists come out. The over 600 scientists have signed a letter calling for a pause on this industry. And most importantly, we may not need these metals at all. We're seeing companies that are increasingly realizing that they don't need these metals from the deep ocean for their supply chains. At the BMW Group, we have the aim to have the most sustainable supply chain in the industry. This really concerns all parts that we're purchasing, but also the minerals contained therein. If we look at deep seabed mining, biodiversity is a key concern. There are a lot of science gaps that need to be filled. And until these questions can be answered, we refrain from using those minerals for our vehicles. Our conclusion has been to draft this business statement that as a precautionary measure, we won't use any minerals derived from the deep seabed until we understand the consequences of deep seabed mining activities. 
We also opened this business statement to investors in order not to um, finance deep sea bed mining activities. And we are inviting other companies to also join this business statement. We don't realize it, but actually humankind relies on the deep ocean to keep the planet habitable and to keep us alive. So as it currently stands, going forward with deep sea mining on the scale on which many would like it to go forward is a mistake. The deep ocean is the least known ecosystem on the planet. And as scientists, we certainly need more time to study these poorly known environments. And by understanding them better, it will allow us to manage these ecosystems and protect these ecosystems so that we can keep them around for generations to come. When I think of the deep ocean, this amazing vast set of ecosystems beyond the jurisdiction of any country, I think we know enough to care. We are the generation with the technology. We are the generation with the data and the information to know that the, the deep ocean is fundamentally important to this planet. I hope the next generation look back and go, do you know what? They were smarter than the rest. They did the right thing and they protected the blue heart of the planet. The world doesn't need to mine the deep ocean. This is a living, breathing part of the planet which contributes to global climate cycles and planetary systems. And maybe, for once, we should just recognize that we would be better off, for the benefit of humankind as a whole, to leave it alone and recognize that we need to operate within planetary boundaries, and this would be a great place to start. Bottom trawling season 2021 has begun. New Zealand's bottom trawling fleet is heading out to trawl the ocean for fish. But they catch countless other marine creatures. Bulldozing coral and precious habitats and release carbon stored in the seafloor. Bottom trawling is indefensible. Tens of thousands of New Zealanders want it stopped. We need the Minister for Oceans and Fisheries, David Parker, to act. Uh, we do need to uh, do better in respect of bottom trawling. We have got a review coming out by the Chief Science Advisor. Uh, again, if not before Christmas, it'll be the month after Christmas. I don't have the detailed information to hand to give the member a more fulsome answer. 
I'm expecting commentary on that particular issue to be released uh, following the release of the Chief Science Advisor's uh, report. I agree that forms of bottom trawling can cause uh, damage to habitat uh, and that that needs to be minimised. What more is it going to take? The ocean needs protection from destructive fishing methods. Take action now. I have spoken at some length, yet I am deeply aware that I have not succeeded in treating the question before us as comprehensively as I would have wished. I dare not take too much more of your time. Mr. Chairman, I wonder whether I could take the recess now. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that uh, fantastic series of films showing the deep ocean and the action that is being taken by communities and individuals around the world. Now, I would like to introduce to you our panel. So I'd like to invite our panel to join me on screen. Uh, we will open into uh, a discussion with, our, with a group of experts working at the front lines of deep ocean conservation around the world. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jessica Battle, who is joining us from Switzerland today. Jessica is the lead of the No Deep Sea Mining Initiative for WWF. Welcome, Jessica. Also with us on the panel is Jeremy Ragan, who is dialing in from the Seychelles today. Jeremy is the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Seychelles Islands Foundation, and also a young ocean leader for the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Also with us today is Pelena Tita Kara. Tita, would you like to join us online, unmute and, and open up your video? Tita is joining us from Tonga today. Tita is the national coordinator for the deep sea mining campaign for the Tonga Civil Society Forum. Welcome, Tita. And finally, also with us, dialing in from the Pacific region is Carly Thomas, dialing in from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Carly is an ocean advocate, and she's also the lead of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition campaign to protect sea mounts in the South Pacific. So we're very fortunate to have you all with us. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm going to start with, with a couple of questions for each of our panelists, but to all of you who are joining from around the world, please use the chat function as well to input any questions that you would like asked of the panelists. And we'll make sure to to try and pick those up and, and answer as many of those as we can along the way. So first of all, Tita, over to you. We've seen and heard in the films that we've just watched, a lot of connectedness that is being make and made between the health of the ocean uh, and the health of individuals, of people and of communities. How does that resonate with your experience working on these issues in Tonga? Thank you, Zen. Um... And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I think, Zan, the um, if you actually put health and people and uh, the ocean, they're all equal in value. Um, it cannot be ocean plus health equal Tongan people. They are basically the same because the ocean is the heart of the Tongan people. It basically contains 99% um, of all area of Tonga. So only 1% devoted to the land and the rest of it is the sea. 84% of our people are actually coastal residents. And $79 million is generated every year from the eco services that the ocean is provided, plus the tourism, and as well as the livelihood for the people of Tonga. So you 
have seen, you know, some of the comments from my fellow um, Tongans in the short videos that you have actually seen. And it cannot emphasize hard enough the, the feeling that Tongan people have for the ocean. We are voyagers. We arrive in Tonga, you know, traveling from all over the world to populate this country we call our own today. Um, we have our culture intertwined with the ocean. We know the, um, the health-related curative purpose of the ocean. Um, COVID-19 had hit Tonga really hard. And where two people go, they go back to the ocean for their livelihood. They go back to their land um, for the so source of food. So we are scattered over 169 islands um, that made up Tonga. And that connectiveness that we have is through the ocean. So we have so much connected to the ocean as well as the livelihood that we have hope precious today. So I can't say enough, um, Sien, about what the ocean means to us and the interconnectivity between our people and our health to the ocean. Thank you, Tita. That comes out loud and clear, both in, in what you're saying and in the film that we saw as well. Jeremy, that also came out very strongly in the film from the Seychelles, I think. And, and, and we heard a lot of youth voices coming through in a number of the films. How, what, what's going on with, with youth action around these issues in the Seychelles and, and the wider region? Thank you for the question and the opportunity. I mean, from my side, what I've been seeing, and I'm lucky to have one of the panelists is one of my friends, so Sheena Tama. Um, she's a marine biologist who's taking really amazing steps. And I think right now she's about 73% towards the goal of generating enough funds to take Seychelles' first locally uh, based um, um, exploration into Seychelles' deep sea following other international um, explorations that happened since 2019. So you can see a young person actually going out there and, you know, with, with uh, the support of a community, but also international organizations going out and actually understanding what's there. And Seychelles' is, uh, economic exclusive zone is something like 1.3 million square kilometers. So the size of South Africa's landmass. And we're only 98,000 people uh, in a similar situation as in Tonga, you know, with over 115 islands. So this ocean is huge and it's massive to us. We know it's important to us, but we don't know it as well as we'd like to. And something like deep sea bed mining, which may not be happening inside this territory, is happening um, you know, further north when you think about some of the exploration sites. Um, there's also worrying you know, news coming from other places, um, such as in Mauritius's um, cabinet of ministers when mid-October we had um, you know, movements around not just oil exploration, but generally natural resources uh, in the deep in that sense. And since Seychelles, you know, um, shares quite a large piece of ocean uh, for the joint uh, management area, about 400,000 square kilometers, so about the size of Germany. You know, there's a lot of things when we're talking about oceans and islands where we are aware of these things, but we don't know about them enough. And so... What I would say is young people in Seychelles are very, very attached to the ocean and increasingly so. We are increasingly asked to go swim, go snorkel, go dive, go out there, um, cherish and love it. And although there are very, you know, a small number of people when it comes to deep sea bed mining, uh, there's analogous um, activities such as exploration for oil, uh, natural gas. This is something actually was a confusion on my part when I first heard of deep sea bed mining. I thought it was exactly, you know, the same issue. But as people learn about these threats, and as they begin to enter that room, which is really poorly lit and filled with very few people, they become very aware and very worried when they hear about deep sea bed mining. They realize that they don't understand it, but they want to understand it. And when they begin to understand it properly, they don't like what they hear. Um, and it's really interesting to hear exactly, you know, some of the characters talking about, do we really need these things? And, and what, at what cost? And why are we rushing into it? So I think in Seychelles, we, with the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, we had a national dialogue, the first of its kind, that generated interest. I think young people are keen about the environment, about climate change, about protecting the ocean. They want to know more about the deep sea and the threats it faces. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to, to know a friend who's taking action by actually going out there and researching more. And uh, yeah, that's, I would say that's our start uh, to this long process. Great, thank you, Jeremy. And what you said about uh, 
every time you open a conversation with someone about deep seabed mining and it's the first time they've heard about it, their reaction is sort of, what, this makes no sense. That is, that's something that we hear over and over again around the world, it's a common theme, which is why it's so important to have these conversations, right? Jessica, um, what we're seeing is that it's not just communities and civil society groups that are taking action on seabed mining, it's also companies are getting increasingly involved. What's going on in that realm? Indeed, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, so companies are starting to take action as well. Um, a group of companies just yesterday joined a manifesto calling for a global moratorium, so a freeze on any seabed mining activities. Uh, these are big companies. Uh, which could be customers to uh, potential seabed mining minerals in the future, but they have chosen instead to say, no, we don't need these minerals, we don't want them. We, uh, we are uh, worried about the uh, effects seabed mining could have on the ocean and on our climate. Um, but, uh, so they are both calling for a moratorium and they are also committing to not sourcing or using these minerals in their supply chains and in their products. It's a very strong statement. And these are companies such as Volkswagen Group, which is the second largest, biggest uh, vehicle manufacturer in the world, car manufacturer in the world, huge uh, transport companies, Scania and Volvo, um, electronics companies, Google, um, battery companies, Samsung, uh, BMW Group and others have signed on. Um, we also have the first bank, uh, sustainability-focused bank, Triodos Bank from the Netherlands has signed on. And I think this sends a really strong signal that, you know, this is not sustainable. Uh, a bank that chooses to go out there and say, we are not going to invest in seabed mining. We do not see this as sustainable. So I think that's very, very important. Um, and there's no place for these minerals in, in the market. And so this really, I think, sends a signal that investors and governments will have to think twice about whether seabed mining is actually something that we need in the future. So that's quite a momentum building, in fact, that, that you're speaking to. And it sounds like it might be just the tip of the iceberg as well. Very exciting. Yes. Turning to you, Carly, because it's not just seabed mining that is a threat to the deep ocean. And we actually had some, uh, some amazing film footage as well of the damage that bottom trawling is doing to the deep sea, which is more your area of focus. What, what's going on, on on that front in terms of action to address that particular threat? Kia ora, Shan, and, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, if we, if we think the clock is ticking for deep seabed mining, when it comes to bottom trawling, the alarm has really been sounding for well over a decade. And there's a small handful of countries, including New Zealand, that just keep hitting the snooze button and allowing this industry to continue. So globally, there are only five countries still bottom trawling on seamounts in the high seas. And I'm ashamed to say New Zealand is one of them. Um, and New Zealand vessels are trawling in our own waters. Uh, we're the only country sending bottom trawl vessels out into the South Pacific trawling seamounts. We fish in Australian waters around Tasmania. We've even got uh, a New Zealand company owns a vessel that's fishing in the Indian Ocean, but doing so with a Cook Islands flag. So we're really having an outsized impact on the seabed with the New Zealand industrial trawl fleet. Um, as you can imagine, these, these are huge weighted nets. The, the trawl doors in the sides of these nets can be 500 to 800 uh, kilograms a piece. And the weighted ground ropes are basically dragged across uh, delicate sponge and coral communities. And you can imagine it's like the proverbial bull in, in a china shop. So it's an incredibly destructive way of fishing and New Zealand is having a really big impact. And we, we're simply not being a good Pacific neighbor on this. Um, Right now, New Zealand is permitting six vessels from our country to fish in the South Pacific. These are the only vessels still trawling out there. And all of them, all these vessels belong to companies that have got recent convictions for illegal trawling in protected areas. They're also trawling in New Zealand waters and doing damage to most of our corals aren't, we don't have coral reefs here. So our corals are these deep sea corals and that's where they're trawling and targeting species like orange ruffy down there. Um, this shocking bycatch, uh, we, we went through the records because we've been taking this issue up to, to the government, you saw in, in the Greenpeace video there. Um, 
In some cases, bycatch has been one or even five tons per trawl was the worst case of bycatch we've had. So these can be really shocking amounts. So what we're doing here, um, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition has a number of member groups in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and we've been working actively in alliance with um, six of them over the past couple of years. Last year, we delivered a petition to the new Oceans and Fisheries Minister, who you saw on the video. Um, and with that petition, it, we had more than uh, 50,000 people had signed it. Now we're close to 70,000. Um, and we actually delivered it with a life-size model of that piece of coral that you saw being dumped overboard by a New Zealand trawler. And that piece was um, estimated to be around 500 year, years old, and it's just gone in a flash with a trawl vessel passing over it. So we delivered that petition to him, and it's now in front of the Environment Committee. Um, we're, we've been presenting as a, as a group and publishing reports and, and videos and so on. Um, tomorrow, we actually have our final presentation to the Environment Committee, and then they'll recommend to, to um, Parliament around this issue. So we really have sort of um, an active campaign going on here at the moment, uh, but we need it because the destruction's continuing here in New Zealand, and we're doing damage in the Pacific. Terrifying. Thank you, Carly. And and we saw in the film uh, and 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 in a report that was released earlier this year that in addition to the sort of massive damage that that you're speaking to about, you know, it, the immediate damage to the habitats of, of a troll, the the impacts on carbon sequestration and and how this is actually negatively affecting the ocean's ability to to mitigate against climate change. So there's sort of immediate and longer term damage that, that's being caused. So we have a question in from, from the, the participants and please, those of you online, uh, do keep sending questions into the chat box because we, we do have a chance to now, to now get some answers from this amazing set of experts from around the world. The first question, and I think I'll direct this at least to you, Jessica, to start with, is how do you stop miners if, if your government is, is supporting them or sponsoring them? And I wonder, Tita, maybe after Jessica, if you might have a, a thought on this as well. Jessica. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sean. And also thanks to the other panelists for such great insights and contributions. Um, how do you stop miners if your government supports them? Um, one way of doing that is to petition the government to instead of investing in mining, and supporting mining to instead invest in forward-looking solutions, um, in, including circular economy and other solutions to the problems that we face today. And that you could put a mirror up to a new government and say that the, your government uh, agreed to the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which has a slew of different um, commitments around climate change, around biodiversity, and that all and sustainable production and consumption that all um, uh, would be eroded if seabed mining was to start. So that's sort of taking the high ground. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. But that's that investment, switching the investment to, to the more circular economy, I think is very, very important. The other one is to find out who in government is actually supporting this. And perhaps not all ministries are supporting this. And so also try to, to, to investigate in that regard. And, and find supporters for a more uh, precautionary approach. I guess the last thing I want to say is that there is no seabed mining happening today. Uh, a lot of the developments um, are around trying to find money in order to develop technology. A lot of what we see today is, is I think, a bit of a bubble. And as such, I think there's also um, important to point that out. Seabed mining is not happening today and we can't stop it. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. What are your thoughts on, on this, Tita? Oh, we are on mute. Thanks, Ian. I think um, I kind of, this is a, a real issue for Tonga because um, we have had a, a conversation with the um, deputy CEO for geology and then stood on the 23rd of um, September this year, our prime minister signed a contract with the um, Deep Green now um, total uh, metal company. So if by 2023, uh, we have the, um, the go ahead trigger to start mining, total metal company will automatically start a 25 year um, license to exploit. 
So, so this is real for me um, in Tonga because while everybody else is discussing whether they're going to go ahead, we know Tonga is already there. It's just a matter of the technica technicality component of it. So, Sien, that's why I invest so much of my time in the international lobbying and advocacy because if we cut the beast head off, if total metal company is dead and you know whatever it is, it's not going to happen in Taiwan. So, because the government now has already invested, you know, they've already signed a contract. We are legally binding. And even if we are going to ask the government, the new government that just, you know, uh, started on the 18th of um, November, even if we ask them to um, resent the contract, that will cost us millions. We have seen what um, um, the um, metal company has done in, in Mexico. Mexico. So I don't want that to happen in Tonga. We don't have the money to be sued. So what I'm praying and working on is a strategy that we can actually make total um, metal company go out of business so they won't have any money in, in Tonga because they are the only one who pose the threat to Tonga. Right? So that is my, and of course, I take on what Jessica has been saying. That is an ongoing process that we're actually working on. But, you know, immediately my first priority is to make sure that both metal company is not operational by 2023, hopefully, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Tita. Amazing work that you're doing on that front. We have another, we have two questions come in that I'd actually like to maybe weave into one, Jeremy, and, and, and direct at you as a start, at least. One of the questions is, what, what are communities concerned about when they hear about seabed mining? What, what are the actual concerns? And the other is, how do we weave this? How do we get students involved? How do we get young people activated on these issues? Yeah, thank you for those. Um, and just building on what's been said, I think it's always about more people getting into the room and knowing about these things, right? So for Seychelles, the concerns are, are very much further away than in Tonga's case, you know, it's something that there isn't exactly uh, a company in, in Seychelles saying we want to do this, we want to do it this way. Um, and I think for us where people get concerned is one, you know, it's such a place that we like in terms of the scientists I speak to, in terms of um, their view, it's we haven't gone there yet. Um, these ecosystems um, are basically ones where we have yet to figure out exactly their role for the, the provision of, of our food, for the climate regulation, all these other things is still something that we still have to figure out. So from the scientific community, which is one side of this, is, is, is the case of we haven't even had a chance to get there. From the local community, um, from these people who are maybe less of okay with, with the science of, of the ocean and, and how it's connected to our lives, um, they still see things like whether it's fishing, whether it's our tourism activities, these things are just part of the ocean that they are really concerned about when you start saying we're removing things from it and we're doing things to it that will lower its resilience to climate you know change and all these things so once they start understanding that these things are going to put us well deep sea bed mining is going to put us in a position where we're less resilient to climate change they become um seriously in, in, interested in what's going on so it's all about that exposure to information in that sense and i think that's where that next question goes in um, you know, as someone who's the, the communications and outreach coordinator for Seychelles Islands Foundation, the, the, the atoll behind me is about a thousand kilometers from the main population. So on a daily basis, uh, our team, we have to figure out how do we make somewhere so far away, beautiful, um, you know, uh, important and, and in some ways accessible and connected to their lives. And I think for us, a lot of this is, you know, for, for kids, it's about really going to the people who've seen this, you know, we have scientists who are there and they're able to tell us about these stories. I mean, one of the great people I've, I've seen talk about this is, is Dr. Diva Amon, um, you know, just in one of these clips. And these are the people who've gone there and seen it with their eyes. And they bring back this excitement. They bring back the discovery. And for a kid who's interested in whether it's space, exploration, whatever, you know, having a real life adventure, say, hey, this is really cool. This is really important. Um, this is why you should, you should care. Um, that's such a, a, a positive way to bring people into this to start off with and i agree poetry um you know different expression for art there's a really i think actually it's on uh, jessica's twitter um uh, the video of um uh, it's really animated and, and really brings out the lights and all these like spectacular shows that you see under the sea so once you capture people's imagination 
um, they care um, and they bring it in. And I think the trick is, you know, it's uh, it's a bit of making sure there's not an information overload. Um, basically, once people understand that this thing's important to them, um, it's about then giving them, okay, this, you know, um, particular type of mining will mean noise pollution, which will mean whales are no longer in our area, which will mean we don't get to see whales, you know, during our normal season. And that means tourism. So it's about really making inform the uh, communication and not overloading people and then connecting it to their lives. And some that will work for most people. And some people just care for the sake of, you know, the biodiversity, for the sake of beauty, doesn't even need to necessarily connect it to lives. That's also something that is important to, to recognize in this. Um, but yeah, I hope that's that's answering both of those questions. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. And Carly, I wondered if you had anything more to add on how you make something that is so remote accessible to people and and there's another question sort of linked to that which is if you brought a policy policy makers down to the deep what would you want to show them oh you're on mute carly sorry <laughs> every time um i think the deep sea really it's got its own cast of characters that really speak for themselves and i think whether you're talking with policy makers or you're talking with students just the array of creatures that are down there is, is so compelling. And, and to think that, you know, we would go out and pretty much intentionally destroy the, the habitats that they live in is kind of unthinkable. I mean, from, you know, delicate China-like corals through to glow-in-the-dark sharks and fish with a little lantern hanging over their eyes blobfish, you know, they're all there. It's just a cast of characters. And then contrasting that with the, the impacts of the industrial gear that we're talking about. So I mentioned that the trawl doors on these bottom trawl nets of um, 500 or 800 kilos. And if you look at the, the equipment that's actually used for, for seabed mining, it's, it's almost like it's come from some horror book, really. It, it's just, you know, out of the Lorax, perhaps. Um, and, and seeing the damage that that can do. And, it, and, and you just really put two and two together and see that, that we're going to be losing these incredible creatures and the habitats that they live in if we put these gears out there and, and destroy what we've got. Mm. Oh, on, on that topic, Carly, um, another question that's come in. One of the films spoke to the impact of bottom trawling on carbon. Can you tell us more about how bottom trawling impacts carbon sequestration? And... and and the, the, the question goes on to, should we, should we be worried about seabed mining in that context as well? I don't know if you're able to speak to that at all. Yeah, that's been quite a recent study that came out earlier this year, looking at the amount of carbon that's released from bottom trawling generally, not just in the deep sea, but also in, in bottom trawling in shallower waters. And from what I understand, it's really the, the churning up of the seabed and the actual release of carbon that's sunk down from things like um, ocean creatures that sort of die and decay on the seabed. There's a real sort of balance of life going on down there. And the oceans have um, absorbed a lot of the excess heat that's that's been generated in the system due to climate change. And also they have that function of sequestering the carbon down onto the seabed. So anything that's um, that's churning up the bottom and that goes for seabed mining and bottom trawling um, can potentially release that carbon back into the atmosphere. Thanks, Carly. Jessica, you had something to add there. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Carly, for that. Uh, I, I guess what I would like to add is if you think about the vast areas that are uh, under potential seabed mining licenses, um, uh, and, and you think about the role of, of uh, the deep sea and the sea floor, as Carly was describing, to capture carbon, uh, we might be standing for uh, an, an an effect which, you know, an unintended effect, we're good at unintended effects as humans, uh, from seabed mining, uh, which would counter the PR from the seabed miners that we need these minerals to reduce our climate impact if the mm -hmm. actual extraction of these minerals <clears throat> actually contributes to, to worsen the, the situation in the ocean and reduce its capacity to to actually absorb the carbon that we already have in the in the atmosphere and need to somehow get rid of. So you know, really, it seems to be be a bit of a you know, 
it, it might be a, a, a situation that leads to a zero, but it could be leading to much, much worse than that. And that is, I think is the big fear. And again, there's so much unknown, but everything we get to know uh, leads us to, to understand that the, the deep sea, as, as Diva Amon said in, in, uh, in, in the video before, the deep sea is really fundamental to, to life on this planet and we shouldn't mess with it. So something, something that I heard a scientist recently say was that actually the ocean's ability to sequester, to absorb carbon is its biodiversity. That capacity to, to mitigate against climate change is the biodiversity. So an activity like seabed mining or bottom trawling, which destroys biodiversity, fundamentally destroys the ocean's ability to absorb. So it's that, that that's a, a, a tight connection as well, Jessica. Yeah, just quickly on that, I mean, that's exactly the same thing as on land, right? We're talking about forests as, as capturing carbon. It's nothing different in the sea. Absolutely. So we have a question, um, how, can we get, how can we get the importance of the ocean better recognized by climate decision makers? I throw that out to all of you. Mm. Um, Tita. Sin, I think I'll go first on, on that one. Um, Ted, a little bit of um, to what have been said before, um, Jeremy made reference to how youth um, kind of uh, contextualize um, deep sea mining. And we all understand from all consultations and advocacy across the, um, the global, um, the importance to get message through to various um, target audience. Um, but for decision makers, and climate change um, platform. I think um, the scientific data that we have and the fact that over 600 scientists actually sign up to, you know, for a moratorium on deep sea mining, that should be a very good global indicator. Second is the global pulse taking during the motion 69 during IUCN's um, uh, meeting. You know, that massive uh, number of international votes should, you know, should have indicated already decision makers. We have SDGs, you know, indicators that need to be met. We have convention that have been signed up by various uh, uh, global parties across the globe to conserve the ocean and mitigate the environment, uh, the climate change. But we know the ocean is the biggest regulator of it. And, you know, we know that it's taking heat already and, you know, deep sea mining is just going to compound that, you know, um, the stress level that the ocean is currently taking, you know, with fear the carbon sequestration, also the methane leak. So, you know, this is compounded and they should already have that. I'm thinking of um, that um, who have been, you know, we have, you know, uh, Kylie and them have been giving him a chance to actually make a decision, but they're still delaying on it. So, yeah, you know, I don't know what else we could say. Oh, thanks, Tita. That's already a, a, a lot to, to consider. Any other thoughts very quickly uh, on how we might bring the ocean more into the dis climate decision makers' radar? For me, I think yeah, it's a... I come in. The... Oh. Carly Sorry. and Jeremy. <laughs> Um, that the ocean is our biggest ally if we treat it right. It's our biggest ally in fighting climate change, but we have to treat it right. And right now we don't actually deserve a friend like that. We need to turn around how we're treating the ocean. We, we sort of see our industrial activity in the ocean as being out of sight and out of mind. It's, it's even more remote than what happens on land and we can visualise. So I think we need to really bring that home to people and start turning it around to being being a friend to the ocean so it can be our ally in the fight against climate change. Thank you. Jeremy, did you have a quick response on that as well? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight two things I've seen. I mean, going to the pre-COP, you know, something like ocean was only added after the fact that several different activists brought it up. So the ocean is increasingly being in this space, but that tells you enough that deep sea isn't even mentioned there, right? So it's all about that comparison between terrestrial and ocean. And I think from the Sustainable Ocean Alliance's side, you know, we've done a global blue new deal that really goes into um, 
inclusion of deep sea and it really talking about its role, as we say, as an ally, as the greatest tool in, in this fight against climate change. And for me, it's amazing and it's taken all this time because you look at the UNFCCC, you look at the CBD, and there's not this kind of overarching working together on these things. You know, we know the carbon pumps um, that, 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 that science is bringing up in terms of whether it's whales and other biodiversity bringing you know, carbon down into the deep sea and stuff. And so that there's not this, I'd say international collaboration or overlap between the CBD and the UNFCCC after all this time is something we should be calling for a lot more. Um, and I think activists, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's a bit tricky because at the end of the day, you have indigenous people, you have communities uh, directly visually impacted by, um, by you know, um, companies going in and deforesting. And I think this is the thing, us as islanders, us as people connecting more to the ocean, we need to understand how we are connected to these spaces. And really, I am, I'm amazed, at, like as, as I've seen in, in the Cook Islands, in Tonga, how people are really connected and saying, hey, this might be far from me, but this is, this is part of me. Um, yeah. So the more of that we can do, the better. That's a beautiful quote. This might be far from me, but it is part of me. I like that. One last question very quickly, if anyone is able to take this, who pays for the damage? When, when this stuff is happening far away from, from out of sight, out of mind, who pays ultimately? Jessica. I can just kick it off. Uh, at the moment, there is no agreement about who is going to pay for the damage. So it will probably not be the companies doing the damage who would pay for it. Uh, whether it is in, in, in international waters or in, in national waters, probably all of us are going to pay for it at the end of the day, but those most vulnerable will pay the highest price. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, with that, um, I, I would like just to, we've got just a couple of minutes left, and I'd like to ask each of you, maybe just for 20 or 30 seconds, um, do you, what, what is your hope? Do you have hope for the future of the deep ocean? I'll start, Sam. I do. I do have hope. I believe because I was brought up to believe. I care because it's part of me. And I think collectively we're actually gaining, you know, international global momentum to protect our ocean. I have said, you know, we believe in democracy and the ocean wins hands down. It consists 70% of the ocean. So I have hope because people are listening. Thank you, Tita. Harley? Sure, I, I also have hope. And I think part of that comes from the real collaboration and the community that pulls together when these issues are before them. Um, we're seeing that in New Zealand. We've got um, groups from across the spectrum working together on bottom trawling. We've also got groups working across the spectrum and with our Pacific neighbors on deep seabed mining. And I think that those voices and, and that sort of power of community in front of decision makers really has to get through. Thanks, Carly. Jeremy. Definitely hopeful. Um, the signals that certain companies are sending out. I mean, we, we lived in a capitalist society, so to see such profit-driven but I think that's, that's a very clear sign that things are, are possible to stop it before it happens in, in many cases. So that's a great signal. And if us consumers go to these companies and say, yes, this is the right way, we can reward or encourage further companies to do the same. And although we might be a still small number of people in this room, that we are aware of this problem, uh, emerging problem, emerging threat um, is a great sign. I don't know how many other environmental issues had the same kind of, um, I would say, conscience from, from, from researchers, from activists. And if it's small, it is growing. So that gives me hope. Thank you. Jessica, last yes. word on hope. I'll just add another, another one to that. I do think that we are going to see behavior change in consumers over the next decade or so. Um, and we already are seeing, you know, companies that are offering um, recyclable parts of their gadgets such as the apple iphones just now launched a new one where you can actually take it apart wow you know and you don't have to chuck the whole thing um and i think those kind of things are going to happen costumers are going to ask more for those kind of solutions longer lives who wants to sit in a traffic jam for hours let's you know public transport uh, you know those kind of solutions i think are going to to come 
much, much more to the fore as the world is grappling with, with, the, with the dual climate and biodiversity crisis. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. And I have to say, spending the last hour with the four of you gives me even more of a sense of hope for the deep ocean that we are coming together and, and that there is this momentum that is that is taking taking shape and will be relentless. Thank you so much to all of you who have joined us, to all of you who've dialed in from around the world. This is uh, this session will be posted online as well as all of the films, which you can take and use for whatever you want to in your classrooms, with your, with your groups. So please, if nothing else, keep this conversation going for the deep ocean.